how long do you suppose it's going to keep flying? We have been following it for three hours now, while all it does is nothing but fly in a straight line, Seema said, yawning, covering her mouth with her hand. Fargoids obviously have a higher threshold for boredom. I mean, the planet below is beautiful, but still. Maybe they simply don't have a concept of boredom. Can't get bored if you don't know it. Boredom is a thing, Eros replied from his desk in the sensor suite. They had indeed been flying and tracking the interceptor from a distance of about 20 kilometers for long enough that, that the initial intensity of the situation had long since waned. What are you looking for or planning to do now that you have had three hours down there to set up? Well, the jump process has to generate a large energy signature. They look biological in nature, but still have to follow the same physics processes. It has to remain cool on the inside, at least cool enough for their species. So we might expect a large heat output. Well, to be sure, I've got all the instruments down here online. We have a Compton telescope for gamma and x-rays. I have a suite of spectrometers trained on it. It gets us from extreme UV through to extended IR. And below that, I have microwave and radio interferometers. There are a few gaps, but, well, we've pretty much got most of the EM spectrum covered. As for particle detection, I have a tracking chamber strapped on the outside of the hull. We can't get the lighter stuff like neutrinos, but it'll do. Sure, okay, sounds like you've got it covered. Uh, we could try and get its attention, you know, non-aggressively. How so? I suppose spook it somehow. I can plot a jump almost in line with it, and do something like go silent until the indicator hits 95%, then open the vents again. We will light up like a candle. It would at least check whether it's actually keeping an eye on us. Sure, okay, let's do it. Alright, course is plotted, and silent running. There was a slight change in the hum that emanated through the ship. The cooling system has entered a partial bypass of the regular heat vents. Instead, opt in to cook the buffer tanks. 70%, 80%, 90%. All right, that's for lot switching to standard power. Anything? Hmm. What's hmm, Eros? Words, use words. It's radio signal changed. It's sort of reduced by a factor of, I don't know, two-ish, and then went back to normal. Did it flip around? I don't have a telescope live feed, he said in a serious dull tone. I think, yes, it did. It's facing us, but it didn't change velocity. It's hard to tell from this distance if it's changing configuration or anything, Seema replied, leaning her head over to the left, squinting at the information panel. Wait, it's coming right at us. Hit the frameshift drive. We need to get out of here. The hum of the drive system increased in intensity, and Celeste counted down as the Fargoid came alongside. Its petals extended, the hue of its gills now red, the asp snapped into which space. They both sat back in their chairs and sighed in unison, though they wouldn't no have known it, being the different parts of the ship. <sighs> this data is not worth dying for. I think all we know is that they have a low threshold for bullshit or aggression, Eros said. He looked at what little data he had. Most of it looked like noise. There'd been a small heat increase when the vessel raced towards them, but little else. It wasn't even clear what the propulsion system was. There had been a trail of ions left behind the ship, but it didn't really appear to be a propellant. There simply wasn't enough of it to throw a ship of that size around like they saw. It looked like ammonia, no surprise there. The main frame shift drive began to alert the cockpit to an instability. Both occupants knew what was happening. The Fargoid vessel was not going to let them leave that easily. Warning, hyperspace conduit unstable, Celeste announced. Eros knew this would hurt. Seema, hold your breath, let go of the controls, and hold on to yourself. What? Seema replied as the ship twisted out of control before roughly dropping from hyperspace, between the origin and destination. Seema gasped. It was nauseating. She coughed any liquids out of her throat and spat them at the ground next to the chair, clearing the sensation of choking brought on by the collapse of the frameshift field. She took hold of the controls and moved them gently. Nothing happened. The controls are dead, Eros. Eros, do you hear me? He didn't. The ship had entirely shut down. The power plant was in the process of venting plasma into space, as though it was in an emergency state. Complete and total silence. The Fargoid interceptor drifted slowly up to the canopy, its central glass dome-like eye a swirling mix of confusion and reflections. Seema looked back, her eyes this time fixed 
with anger more than fear. If the main computer was running, Seymour would have heard the far grid bellow at the asp once more. Instead, the void of space silenced its otherwise intimidating scream. The ship drifted backwards and began rotating. A low hum began to grow within the ship, and a quiet voice came through the speakers. Seema, don't activate anything. I need to get us into cruise mode. It won't follow us if we can get that far enough away. How? The power plant needs to call start. I know, which is why the second frame shift drive is going to activate. For about four seconds from the auxiliary cells, it should be enough to get us, like, I don't know, 120 kilometers or something away. It won't be much, but a cold start has already been initiated. We need about two minutes. We can remain drifting until you think it's going to get aggressive. That is hard to know, and I can't see what is happening outside. 